deal with the thing. Now, how many of you have ever been attacked by a devil? Now, either one reason or the other, either you don't know what to look for, and you don't realize it's a devil, amen, or else you just really haven't got there yet. Amen. Hallelujah. Because I can promise you, you will not have the Holy Ghost very long before he begins to attack. Amen. Uh, I think I had the Holy Ghost maybe two days. <laughs> maybe. And the first thing he said is, you didn't get the Holy Ghost. And I thought, man, I guess I didn't get the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I went and talked to my pastor about it, and he said, I don't know anybody's ever got the Holy Ghost. He didn't tell that to. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So... It makes sense. He's a liar. He's the father of lies, the Bible said. And so he can't tell the truth. I don't know how hell gets anything done. They never can tell the truth. So <laughs> when they talk to each other, I wonder if they tell the truth then. Amen. Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to talk tonight about how to deal with satanic attack. Hallelujah. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. Amen. That's a long fast. How many of you ever fasted 10 days? Okay. How many of you ever fasted 3 days? 3 days fast. I know most of you have done that because I've asked you to do that before. What about 1 day? All right, there's several hands there. But imagine fasting 40 days. Amen. And he is not just fasting 40 days. He is in the wilderness, in the desert, literally fasting 40 days. And he didn't have no igloo cooler with him for a drink. Okay? <laughs> so when the tempter came to him, he said, well, the Bible said he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and he afterward was in hunger. Amen. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taken him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of a temple, of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taking him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, all these, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And Jesus chuckled. <laughs> Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Hallelujah. I want to teach just for a little while tonight how to deal with satanic attack. Hallelujah. Now, I think this is essential because I know a lot of folks is going through hell and murder right now. Amen. I know a lot of folks that are dealing with that are dealing with satanic attack. Amen. So why don't we just ask the Lord to help us. And, uh, let's see if he can get our spirits where we can be teachable tonight. God, Lord, I'm asking you right now, Lord, by your authority, by your power, that you would open our hearts to your word tonight, Lord. That this teaching, God, would go into our hearts and our minds, Lord. It would settle in, God. That we would understand, that we would have our understanding open, God, as to what we're dealing with in the spirit world, God. Help us tonight, God, to follow your spirit. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, you can be seated. Now, in the very first verse of this uh, chapter 4, I pray that you're hearing. Amen. The Word lets us know that many times our spiritual attacks are generated in the spirit world, and often it's God's Spirit that leads us directly into the wilderness to face the attack. The Bible said that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Hallelujah. Amen. That Spirit that dwelt in Him, He was God in flesh. Amen. That same Spirit that dwells in us, it dwelt in Christ Jesus, that's what the Bible said. So we have the Spirit of God. We've got the exact same Spirit Jesus had. But where, you ever notice the difference between us and Jesus? Satan barked at him, he barked back. Hallelujah. Satan barks at us and we have a pity party. Oh God, the devil's after me. Oh God, he's been after me all day long. He just won't let up. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you what to do, okay? So, many times the spiritual attacks are generated in the spirit of the world and often it's God's spirit that leads us directly into the wilderness to face the attack. Why would God do this to a human being who has just received the Holy Ghost? Wow. Why would he allow this to happen to someone who's had the Holy Ghost for many years? You know? Can you make sense out of God? No. Don't even try. Amen. Because if you do, you're going to be uh, left standing beside the road. I, I remember several years ago, my dad was preaching over around the Leesville, Louisiana area, and I don't know if you, anybody knows it, but Fort Polk Army Base, or military base, it's an army base there, is there in Leesville, and uh, it's the largest infantry soldier base pretty much in the world, except for this one down here in South Texas, amen, and uh, Fort Hood. So we were over there, and this was back during the time I was a teenager, it was during the Vietnam War, and we are driving to a revival service that my dad is going to be preaching that night, and uh, we always would leave early and get there early so we'd have time to kind of freshen up a little bit and to, to pray a while before the service started and get everything set up because I always drew a picture of what my dad was painting, I mean, was preaching or teaching. And so um, we're busy setting everything up, but on the way there, we were driving through these big, tall pine trees. Anybody ever been to Louisiana? Amen. Louisiana is like East Texas. We have these huge pine trees, 120 foot tall, big boys. And, and there was just a big, huge forest of them. And all of a sudden, we came to an area where it was kind of clear back in there. And you could see uh, as we're driving along. And so I asked my dad to stop, and we got to looking. And back in those woods were just, it was a, like a whole city back in there of these bamboo huts. Uh -huh. And I got to looking and the people that were walking around out there had these little pointy hats on. And they had like a sarong, that's what they call it, on a, a one-piece garment that kind of came down like a robe that, that went to their ankles and or their knees or whatever. And, and, and the men had the same thing and then they had like the breeches on underneath and, and I, I'm looking and I, I thought, what is that? And my dad said, those are, that's Vietnamese. I said, so why do we have Vietnamese in a pine forest with bamboo huts? <laughs> I'm trying to figure this out. Where do they get bamboo in the first place? We don't even have bamboo in, in Texas, in Louisiana, except for fishing boats. <laughs> and, and so my dad began to tell me, he said, what this is, this is part of Fort Polk, this is the training camp. Uh -huh. yeah. What happens is they actually build a Viet Cong village there, a Vietnamese village there. And in that village, there are people who are supposed to be citizens. And it's really just played by American folks. I've got a, a friend down at home, that, me and my wife do, that uh, that's what he's done for the last several years. Except this time he was an Arab. Uh, he was, he was, they have an Arabic village built out there. And, uh, they teach them how to go in and go house to house. And in the Vietnam era, they also had tunnels and they had 
what they call tunnel rats, people that would go down in those tunnels and flush out the Viet Cong, but the Viet Cong, Cong were smart. They had those tunnels booby trapped, so they actually had the tunnels set up there and everything so that the soldiers could go in and see all the different booby traps that were set. And what it was, my dad said, is they are training these guys how the enemy will attack. Yeah. Hallelujah. They are training these guys to go into a Vietnamese village and to expect Viet Cong. <laughs> Amen. Because many times the villagers were innocent, just normal citizens, but the Viet Cong would be in there amongst them. And many times they would go into a house and there would be a mat on the floor and they would pull up that mat and there would be a tunnel that went down. And that's where the Viet Cong were at. And so uh, they were teaching them and training them how the enemy operated. So what's happening here is the Spirit has led Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This is a training ground. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not for Jesus. He was God in the flesh. He didn't need no training. All he had to say was, look, you better move on over here. I'm fixing to kick you on the other side of the world. And it ain't going to be funny. <laughs> but Jesus went through all the temptations that Satan had to offer for two reasons. One, Satan really did not know who he was. He didn't know that was really God in flesh. He did not know that yet. And the other thing was, he wanted us to have an example. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. He wanted that to be a training ground uh -huh. so that we could see how, when the spirit world attacks us, to deal with it. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. So it was not a mistake that he was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted to devil. Amen. Uh, Joe probably thought the same thing. What in the world going on here? When God pulled the hedge back and let Satan in him. But, but the deal was, God was just setting up examples. All through the Bible, there's examples, amen, of people that are being attacked and being tempted and being pushed around by spirits, amen, and, and, and their response to that. Some of them, their response wasn't all that great. Some of them are like these little, what we call snowflakes we got nowadays. They get offended at everything. We got Christian snowflakes, folks. Come on, you got this recording. Go ahead, record all this. I want to put this on. We have got Christian snowflakes now. Yes, sir. We got people in the church that are snowflakes. The devil comes pushing them around, and they just kind of melt. Yes. <sighs> think I just go over here in the corner and have myself a pity party. I'm gonna suck my thumb. I'm sorry, but the Word of God said that a Holy Ghost filled person is not easily offended. Uh -huh. Oh, my, my, my. I know when the enemy comes in like a flood, the devil comes in like a flood, there's a Spirit of God around me. Hallelujah. Sure. Amen. That's going to lift up a standard against him yeah. if I do what I'm supposed to be doing. That's, that's not an optional deal. Amen. God's just not going to protect just everybody. But if you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, amen, there is protection provided as long as you're doing your part. Oh, Lord. So here we go. So that training camp of soldiers, amen. Jesus had fasted for 40 days. Look at the end of how the enemy approached him. If thou be the son of God. Now, notice what he's doing. He's attacking him uh -huh. on the outside first. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. He's trying to put doubt in his mind if he has that position uh -huh. or not. <laughs> he comes to the cover. No, you don't really have the Holy Ghost. Is, was that the Holy Ghost you got, or were you just jibber jabbering down there the other night? Uh -huh. Can I tell you, when you receive the Holy Ghost, there is more than just tongues. Oh, yes, sir, yes. Hallelujah. Tongues is an outward sign of an inward change. Woo! Yes, Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Let me tell somebody here tonight. 
Amen. When the Holy Ghost comes in, all of a sudden this smile will come over your face. Your countenance will change. Amen. You'll, you'll feel totally different. I, I've had them come, come out of out from under the Spirit. And what do they do? The first thing they do is start reaching around, grabbing everybody they can grab and hugging them. Amen. I've seen old tough guys that, man, you couldn't have got hardly a handshake out of them. That's a hug. All right. Amen. But when the Holy Ghost gets on, hallelujah, they just wrap you up in a big hug. You know why? Because the Bible tells me that this makes you love. Amen. Your neighbor raise yourself. Hallelujah. Come on. When the Holy Ghost comes in, that hatred that you had, amen, that malice that you had, it's all gone. Now God has replaced it with his love. Oh, Lord. Now, now you love everybody but Satan. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I ain't never loved him and never will. In fact, if there's anybody in the world I hate, it's him. Amen. But I can do that because God does. All right. So, it comes first to him. Jesus is just off a 40-day fast. And he first comes to him and said, if you are who you say you are. Come, let me tell you something. I've had folks come to me and, say, and ask me or tell me, if you really are what you say you are, then you ought to be able to heal me. No, I can't heal one person. I, I can't heal anybody. I don't have that power. Amen. But the God in me has that power. Hallelujah. The God in me has that authority. Amen. He can simply speak to that disease and it will be gone. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I have to operate in faith because I have to do my part if I'm going to be praying for somebody that's sick. I have to operate in faith believing that when we pray, God answers. It doesn't matter what it is. I just have to believe that. Amen. That no matter what I'm praying for, God answers. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I prayed for folks that were about to bust up and going to divorce. And we, we've done that before. My wife will tell you, we prayed for folks that were just about to bust up. And, and when we got through praying, God mended it and put it all back together. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, he even tried to make the physical man, Jesus, doubt that he was God manifest in the flesh. Now, let's look back at the previous chapter. Let me show you what's happening. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized of him. And John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Everybody say all righteousness. All right. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. He wasn't sprinkled, folks. Hallelujah. He was in water. Amen. It's hard to get one of the little bitty bowls. They got on the little bitty tables. You know, and baptize yourself. Amen. So, when he came up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Now, Jesus is the one seeing all this. The Bible didn't say the whole crowd saw it. It just said he saw it. And a lower voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. So I have to try and get Jesus to doubt who he was. Satan tempts him to miraculously turn the stones away. Now, first of all, he, he is trying to get him to, to doubt his Godship. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. He, he's trying to get him to doubt that he, first of all, he's kind of sort of questioning and at the same time. He's, if it, just in case you are, uh -huh. if you are the Son of God, then. Turn these stones into bread. Now, Jesus didn't do it, of course. One, if he would have done it, he would have been obeying Satan. And I'll be John Brown and I'm going to obey him. I obeyed him long enough when I was in the world. Hallelujah. I followed him around long enough back when I used to live for him. Amen. But you see, when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, he changed my direction. He made a new creature out of me. Amen. And Satan can't stand me and the feeling's mutual. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't even like to be in the same room with him. You ever been there? With somebody? I just don't like to be in the room with those folks. 
There ain't very many people I can say that about, but there is one spirit of hell I can say that about. All right, so after he tried to get Jesus to doubt who he was, Satan tempts him to miraculously turn the, miraculously turn the stones into bread. Notice what he said. But what John said about it, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, everybody say lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, everybody say lust of the eyes. Lust of the eyes. And the pride of life, say pride of life. Pride of life. Is not of the Father, but is where of the world. Yeah. Satan has only three pieces of ammunition. He might have a big gun, but he can't use it for three times. You know, we got three pieces of ammunition. And that's why he quit when he got the last thing with Jesus, because he done used it all up. It was all gone. Hallelujah. Because that's exactly what he used. If you, if you study out the temptation of Christ, amen, those three things are exactly what he used. Amen. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Amen. Now, so... And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Hallelujah. Satan had the audacity to try to tempt Jesus through the lust of the flesh. Notice the Bible said Jesus was hungry. And so Satan is he's doing two things here. One, he's wanting Jesus to obey him, which would make him Lord in Jesus' life. Hello. And the second thing he's wanting to do, he's wanting him to fulfill a lust that he has right now. Uh -huh. He's hungry. <laughs> he's on a 40-day fast. He just got off a 40-day fast. He's hungry. Now, I'm sorry, but I know Jesus in the Word of God more than one time. Amen. Multiplied loaves and fishes and other things. Amen. There were plenty of food. I, I remember one time after he had resurrected and, and came back and uh, they're out fishing and they looked over and they saw a fire burning on the beach. They looked and there's Jesus sitting by the fire and, and so they took their boats and went up to the fire and there he was. The Bible said he was cooking fish over the fire. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't know if his wife perch or not. Probably so. He, he, was, he probably enjoyed the same stuff we did. But, but I, I, I'm watching because here the enemy's coming in, and the enemy's saying, you know, if you just turn these stones into bread, and it's not that he can't do it, because he's done it many times after that. Hallelujah. He's multiplied fish, he's multiplied biscuits, he's multiplied lots of things. And he could have just simply spoken, food would have been there. Not a problem for him. But he was not about to give any glory to Satan. Hallelujah. And, and so he just turned and he, the Bible said that he turned to Satan and he just began to quote the word to him. Yeah. Amen. Uh, let's look back. Remember when Eve in Genesis, Satan came to Eve and tempted her. He came as an angel of light. Yes, sir. Now how do you know that? Well, he didn't look mean and detestable. Amen. If he had looked like some of the lambs I've seen running around, she would have just went, oh my God, I'm getting out of here. That thing is scary. But he didn't look mean and detestable. He looked pleasant to her eyes, or she wouldn't have stood there and talked to him. There was a question whether the countless could talk or not. Probably hadn't been there that long. I really didn't know. So, he had, he had a seducing demeanor. He still has it, folks. Yes, sir, he does. If the devil comes to you and he's all you know, you know that's the devil. But if he comes looking good, he comes sporting on a different suit. Yes, sir. And he comes to you and he's talking all these sweet things to you. Uh -huh. Amen. Be sure he's coming as an angel of light. Uh -huh. Amen. And you have to be aware of the things, yeah. of the way he produces himself and comes to people. Amen. He's not going to come growling and barking and snapping at you if he wants to seduce you. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Oh, 
Hallelujah. Amen. He's not going to do that. He, he's going to come so subtly that unless you are really on fire with God, yeah. you will believe every word he's saying. That's why people can fill arenas here in our land and never preach anything out of the Bible. Uh -huh. Because they are so subtle, that spirit is so subtle that it presents himself as being something that it's not. Uh -huh. And people like the words that they hear, so they flock to those places. Uh -huh. But they don't preach against sin. Uh -huh. Amen. Uh -huh. Oh, Lord. You gotta know that you gotta have a man of God in your world that's gonna preach against sin and tell you that if you do this and so, you will not make heaven your home. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. And that's what we believe. That's what we preach. Amen. All right. So he, he, he was so slick that he stopped and listened to him. But then look what happens. The next thing is he begins toying with her emotions. <laughs> He begins playing with her emotions. And he tells her, you know, if uh, if this is really God that said this, you know, then he lied to you. You know, he come in such a so soft way that she listened to every word that beast had to say. And she stood there and she looked at that fruit. She had probably passed by that tree many times and never really paid it attention because God had said don't touch it. Uh -huh. Amen. How many times have you been by things that God has said don't mess with? Yeah. It's a sin. And yet you ignored it because you knew it was a sin, but then one day all of a sudden you're, you're, you're sitting there and, and you begin to think on that and it just pops in your head. You ever, you ever have that happen? Yeah. And it just pops in your head. You're like, what? Where did that come from? And most of the time, we, we will put it out of our mind and we'll start, you know, quoting Bible verses or singing or whatever. But many times, the devil comes in so quietly and so slick, amen, that we begin to entertain thoughts that we shouldn't entertain. Yeah. Mm. Come on oh. now. And can I tell you, the longer you entertain a thought, the more vivid it becomes and the more bigger it becomes until finally it begins to seize your being. Tell it, Pastor. Hello. Amen. Ted Bundy. Uh, he was known around the town he lived in by everybody. He was a very outstanding citizen in the, in the town he lived in. Everybody liked Ted Bundy. You go read this, read this little story. Amen. Everybody liked him. He dressed well. He was very soft-spoken, very easy to get along with. People loved him. They talked to him all the time. Uh, the neighbors in the neighborhood thought, man, ain't nobody any better. He would, he would help out his neighbors. Whatever he could do to be a help to them, he would do it. Very likable fellow. But all the time he's being likable to everybody else. He's picking up prostitutes and he's killing them. And uh, many, many, many. I don't remember the exact number. But he gave he gave a little, a little uh, interview to James Dobson years ago, right before his execution. And in this interview, he said, he talked about how that it just started with a thought. And he kept entertaining this thought. And it began to grow and it began to grow and he began to get into things that he shouldn't have got into, pornography and other things. And he said, then it began to grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it overwhelmed him to such a degree that he went out and met his first prostitute. And had his way with her and then snuffed her life out. Well, he got away with that. And so a few months later, it began to, there was something about the thrill of it, he said, that kept driving him to go back again and again and again and again. And nobody in that area could figure out who it was. 
If the people in that neighborhood had a known they had a serial killer living right next door who was helping mow their yard and trim their hedges for them, helping the old people paint their houses. But they didn't know that because it was so slick and so sly. But he said it all started with just a thought. And he kept entertaining that thought. Now, Paul said, I take captive every thought of my mind and bringing them under subjection. Oh, come on. We have to take control of our thought patterns. Amen. This is the, you, you hear the Bible talk about the heart of man? It's not this thing in your chest. It's this thing right here. Yes, this sir. is the heart of you. <laughs> Amen. If something goes wrong with the wiring up here, the rest of us go haywire. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. And, and so what happens is Satan gets in with one little thought, uh -huh. and he begins to implant that in you. Now, you've got two things you can do. You can either think on that, or you can put it out and say, in the name of Jesus, get that out of my mind. I rebuke yes, you. Yes. And rebuke that spirit. And begin to sing the praise of God or begin to pray or begin to worship. Whatever it is you have to do to keep that thought away. Amen. And the, and the more you do it, you know what you're doing? You're, you're resisting the devil. <laughs> That's all that is, is resisting him. When he puts a thought in, you push it right back out and, and quote a scripture. You're resisting him. And the more you resist him, the more you help build up that wall around you. Hallelujah. Now. So what happens is then it gets to the place where Satan just finally says, well, I'm not going to mess with him. <laughs> I can't do nothing with this guy. I, I went over here and I tried to put things in his old head. I just couldn't get past the hair on him. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Thanks God for that. He had a hair. Amen. Full head of hair. You know, I guess it's a shine on there. It just slides off. But. Oh. Satan doesn't play, folks. Oh. It doesn't make any difference. If you've got a full head of hair, you ain't got any hair. Amen. That has nothing to do with anything. He's not after the outside. He's after the inside. Right. Hallelujah. He's going to get in the heart of man. Amen. And when he begins to get in this heart... Uh, now, come on, that's why we say that living for God is a heart thing. You know what it is? It changes this. Yes, it, it changes the way you think. It, oh, come on, hear me. When the Holy Ghost comes in, He changes everything about you. And it starts right here. Right. Hallelujah. I, I've had people come to church. We had a, that, that, that just didn't have a clue, man. They didn't know what church was all about. And get the Holy Ghost. And guess what? Without anybody saying anything, all of a sudden you notice things are just missing. Uh -huh. yeah. You notice that they're looking different. And nobody said anything to them. You know what it is? It, it's the Spirit of God up in that heart of that, or that person. Amen. That is changing them. Hallelujah. It, it, they don't, they're not doing it because they want to look like the rest of us. They're doing it because there's something on the inside that's saying, you really don't need that because that could hinder you. Oh, come on. I don't want anything to hinder me from living for God. I want to know without a doubt, amen, that I have the Holy Ghost all time. Hallelujah. Because he can come back the very next minute for me. And what happens when he comes back and you've been listening to the wrong voices? Uh-huh. Oh, Lord. Now, I'm not a party animal. <laughs> My idea of partying is sitting down with these grandbabies uh -huh. with a birthday cake, some ice cream, and buddy, I'm a party animal then. Uh -huh. That's the only time I'm a party animal. You won't see me if you go down to one of these clubs, Brother West. You won't see me in that club. And, and you won't, I won't see most of you guys in there. I don't see any of y'all in there. Hallelujah. Because if I, was, if, I, if I saw you in there, it means I'm in there too. So I better not see any of y'all in there. Right? And, and so what happens? Because we don't yield to that stuff. Amen. We made that a part of our our being. We will not 
do those things that we used to do there. Uh -huh. Satan is not stupid. You know how Satan knows your weakness? You tell him. You know, I just, I just got this problem, and I just can't seem to overcome this. You know? Put it on Facebook. Oh, man, let's announce it to the rest of the world. Satan already knows about it now. Because Satan cannot read your mind. He can put thoughts in your mind, but he cannot read your mind. He does not know your weaknesses. And so what you do is you keep your mouth shut. You don't tell anybody your weaknesses. Because when you do, amen, he picks up on that. And that's exactly where he attacks you at. I don't have a weakness of going to the bar. I don't go to the bars. I'm not going to be at the strip club next Friday night. Or Wednesday night or Thursday night either. Besides that, they wouldn't want to see me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just oh, <laughs> But you know what? There's things that are weaknesses in my world, and they're in yours too. Uh -huh. And Satan, if you let him know what they are, is going to come after that. Amen. Now, I've seen people that were just totally living for God, man, everything just going smooth. And all of a sudden, for no reason at all, they just threw in the towel, backed out, and left. And I'm like, what in the world? They were perfect. They were living for God, man. You could tell they had the Holy Ghost on them. They had the anointing there. And all of a sudden, and you go and you, you find them somewhere on a street corner somewhere or something. Like that. You, you start talking to them and, well, I had this whole issue and I just, you know. Well, why did you tell the meathead about it? Come on. Amen. Because when you let him know, that's what he's going to use. Uh, Hello. <laughs> anyway, so enough of that. So, notice that, Joe, that Jesus quoted the word of God to Satan. He was providing us an example of overcoming power of a true soldier. Let's look at Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power, everybody say power, power. of his might. Uh -huh. Now, he said for you to be strong in the Lord. Uh -huh. Now, if you're strong in the Lord, you're going to automatically, that, might, that power of his might comes with being strong in him. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. You're going to have that, okay? So it's imperative that you be strong in the Lord. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit on how to be strong in the Lord. All right. But look what he said in, chapter, in verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles here comes from the Greek methodia, meaning cunning arts, deceit, craft, trickery. Amen. That's why they call witchcraft the craft. Amen. Satan is a tricker. He's cunning. He's sly. He's not a dunny. Although I call him one. Amen. He's not one. He's very smart, very slick. You know why? Because he's had about three or four hundred centuries of practice. So if he ain't got it perfect by now, he never will. Amen. But but he knows what it's going to take to get in your big skull. Amen. He knows what it's going to take to destroy you. And he, he has nothing else in mind but to destroy you. Well, that's what the Bible said. He came but for to kill, steal, destroy. Yes, Hallelujah. Sir. He wants to steal your victory. Come on, he wants to kill your soul. He wants to destroy your walk with God completely. Uh, yes, sir. And I'm mad at the devil. I, I, I haven't been on Facebook in quite some time just to get on there and read anything. I might breeze through there and look at the, my grandbaby's pictures that they're posting on there. But for just to sit down and read it, I don't do that very much anymore. 
And the other night I was looking at grandbaby pictures, I guess it was last night, and I'm flipping through there looking at the grandbaby pictures, and all of a sudden a post comes up by a good friend of mine. I've known him forever. I knew his dad before I knew him. He, he's in South Louisiana. He was a pastor in South Louisiana. And I looked at him, and at first I didn't I almost didn't recognize him. He's lost a lot of weight. But then I looked at his wife, and I thought, wait a minute, something's wrong here. Oh my God. Because he does, he's not the same person. And she's not the same person. Something has happened. Somebody has listened to the wrong voices and no longer are leading the church. Come on. Now, I've been knowing these folks all my life. I've known him since he was just a little guy. Because we just little guys together. But now, he's nowhere near God. What could happen that could take a man of God and his wife and his family away from God? I can tell you what it is. It's called listening to the wrong voices. There are many voices in the world today speaking. Listen to me. The Bible tells me in Matthew 24, in the last days there would be false prophets. I, I've seen some of them. Amen. I, I was watching a, a YouTube here a while back of, of one of them being interviewed by one of the television guys, I guess is what it was. Anyway, he's being interviewed by him. And the man asked him directly how he stood on homosexuality. And he sidestepped the question 15 different ways. He never answered. Never did. And so. It, the, the interviewer just finally got frustrated and said, do you, do you believe homosexual is okay? And, and he sidestepped that one. He never did give a direct answer. Well, the Bible says for us to love everybody. Well, that doesn't matter. Do you preach against it? I, it you know, if the Bible tells me to love them, I'm going to love them. God loves them. But we got to preach against the sin. God loves them, but he loves them to come out of their sin. Hallelujah. He wants them to come out of their sin. That's why he puts us here. Amen. That's why I don't mind preaching against that stuff. You know, yeah, you may get ramifications from that. Pastor, well, if I do, I do. But you know what? I'm going to preach against sin no matter what color it is. Hello. Amen. All right. So he said, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a battlefield. We have to fight. This is not, a, I preached that one time, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. Hallelujah. Amen. This isn't a place where you can come and party for Jesus. Oh, come on, when the Holy Ghost comes down, we might have a Holy Ghost party every now and then. Uh -huh. I don't even like that terminology because that's the world's terminology. Come on. Okay? I, I, I like that when the Holy Ghost comes in, we have a move of God. Uh -huh. yeah. I, I like it when I feel the Spirit moving on me and, and He just takes over and I can't control my body and I begin to dance in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I, I like to run the aisles when I can. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Amen. But you know what? It, 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 we're living in a day and hour, amen, when Satan's copycatting every single thing. And people are, are, are saying to me, you know, I, I still can feel the same thing I used to feel. Uh -huh. And I'm looking at them, pictures of them on, on Facebook with, with drinks in their hands and sitting in bar rooms and half-dressed. And I'm thinking, my God. How can you say that? Then the scripture comes to my mind that God himself will send a strong delusion. You know what a delusion is? It feels like the real deal. They can still feel the spirit. 
But it's not God. He sent them a delusion. It's a deluded spirit. Oh my. They, they can still lay hands on the sick and they recover because God honors his word. Amen. You hear me? They can still do all the miracles, signs, and wonders. Bible backs that up too. Because it says that day they're going to stand before God and say, God, we do these great works in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I don't know who you are. You worker of iniquity. Amen. You know why? Because the last days we're living in is filled, amen, with people who want to water down truth. Amen. They want one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It ain't going to happen. You're either sold out to Jesus or you're sold out to hell. There is no in-between. There's no gray area here. Hallelujah. Amen. I made up my mind 51 plus years ago that this is the best life I could ever have. Amen. The Holy Ghost came in and he filled me and Satan come after me. And I turned around and I went after Satan for a while. Hallelujah. Oh, uh, come on. Amen. Let's go. So it's a battlefield. All right. He said, we're, we're taking you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girded up with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Notice, the first thing that has to happen is we have to make up our, our, our mind to stand for truth. Not back down, he said, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Does that sound like somebody running? No. No. That sounds like somebody standing. Hallelujah. Having your loins girt about with truth. Uh -huh. The word loins here translates from the Greek ospas, meaning the area of the hips. This is the place where the Hebrews thought the generative power of a man resided. So if we gird or cover that reproductive area of our spirit with the word of God, Satan that cannot get a foothold to stimmy our spirits to reproduce new souls. Did you catch that? First thing Satan's trying to do is to stop the church from growing. Amen. So he comes after you. But the Bible said, gird your loins. Hallelujah. Amen. You, you put on that protection. Amen. To keep the fiery darts away. Hallelujah. I, I want you to notice in this armor, Everything is offensive except for one thing. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes. But everything is offensive, okay? Satan understands that if he can get a foothold on you, you won't reproduce. Uh -huh. Right. Oh, Lord. So he comes attacking. Amen. Next, we have on the breastplate of righteousness. Breastplate comes from the Greek thorax. If you ever study insects, you know what I'm talking about when it says thorax. Yeah. But it means a breastplate or corset consisting of two parts, protecting the body on both sides from the neck down to your waistline. The breastplate protected the vital organs from being compromised during battle. Righteousness comes from the Greek dikiosum, meaning integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting as one ought to be before God. God is not going to have any sin there. He's already said no sin can enter there. So when you stand before him, he's not going to ask you a bunch of questions. He's going to do one thing. The Bible said, Brother West, he's going to check the book and the books. <laughs> the book being the book of life. To see if your name is written there. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible said he will turn you over to the angels and they will cast you into the lake of fire where the worm died not and the fire is not quenched. But if your name is written there, then you don't have to compare you with the books. But the books is talking about the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible, the Word of God. God, God judges us according to His Word. When we answer, we're not going to answer to what we have done on our merit. We're going to answer to what we have done according to His Word. 
Have, have I yielded myself to him? Have I been a righteous person? Have I had on that breastplate of righteousness? You, the breastplate covers all the vital organs. Amen. I want everything to be covered. When I stand before him that day, if it's not covered, hell is my game. It's imperative that you're righteous before God. Amen. I dare everybody in this house to begin to pray on this matter. God, make me righteous. Show me the things in my life that are unrighteousness and help me to know so I can get rid of them. I don't want any unrighteousness in my life. Amen. All right. So, the only way to retain God's righteousness in our ungodly place is to keep the armor in place through prayer and fasting. You cannot stay righteous without prayer and fasting. Amen. Yeah, you remember, we're, this is an armor, okay? Your righteousness is an armor against the enemy. He comes running up and he's got his little sword or dagger or whatever. And he looks at you and he goes, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> that, would, that wouldn't work. <laughs> Not today. Satan ain't looking too good tomorrow either because I'm still praying and fasting. Hallelujah. I'm keeping that righteousness in place because that righteousness, amen, is going to keep the enemy from attacking. Hallelujah. All right. Then it goes on. And your feet shot in the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have to guard our footsteps. Proverbs 6, verse 16. Look at this. These six things the Lord doth hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. And heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. The word mischief here comes from the Hebrew word ra, that means bad or unkind, vicious in disposition, bad, evil, or wicked, in general, of persons or thoughts, deeds, and actions. Amen. I've got to keep my feet in the paths of righteousness. David said in Psalms, Yeah, you know, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't fear any evil. Hallelujah. You know why? Because those footsteps are ordered of God. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. When your footsteps are ordered to the Lord, amen, uh, you don't have to worry. You can walk through the darkest dark, amen, and Satan can be all around you in that valley of death, as it were, and you can just walk right on through with no fear because God is ordering your steps. Hallelujah. You got to keep it clean, folks. The way the enemy, to keep the enemy at bay, is to keep clean. Hallelujah. All right. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Anybody know what a shield is? This is talking about a four-cornered shield. It just came up and it was basically a big square. And, and they would carry it on one arm. And when the archers would begin to shoot their arrows, they could move that shield up and down to protect themselves. In fact, the Roman soldiers had uh, something even greater than that. They would lock all their shields together and make an impenetrable uh, fortress around themselves. And, so, and the ones in the front had theirs locked together and the ones behind them would put them over their head. So when the arrows from the enemy came, they could not pierce them. Pretty ingenious. Man. And God is saying today, if you will take that shield... And you'll bind it together with your brother and your sister. Hallelujah. Amen. If we bind together with each other in prayer and, 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 and pray one for another, you know what we're doing? We're locking shields. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Amen. And so when the enemy comes after the church, we just lock our shields together in prayer. And we pray one for another. And the enemy's arrows cannot pierce. Amen. We don't lose any brethren that way. We don't lose any sisters that way. That's right. Amen. All right. I'm trying to get close here. <laughs> now, take the helmet of salvation. Now, what do we say was up here? The heart, the spiritual heart. Yeah. Amen. That mind. And so you take the helmet of salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. You know what salvation is? 
Amen. It, it, it's the Holy Ghost. So you, you cover your mind with the Spirit. Hallelujah. You know what that does? That means that and that's just like Paul said, I take captive every thought. You're covering your mind with the Spirit of God. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are of good report, think on these things. The enemy doesn't put good thoughts in your head. He ain't coming up with no candy. He comes around putting stuff in your head that might look like candy. Amen. But by the time you thought about it for a little bit, you realize it wasn't. Amen. So the best thing to do is when there's an oddball thought that comes in there is just to find it, rebuke it, cast it aside and say, you ain't doing that today and tomorrow ain't looking very good either. I've got the help of the salvation on hell. I've got the Holy Ghost covering my mind. It's in my heart. It's covering me. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. We're about done. But then the last thing is the only defensive part of the whole armor. And he said, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. It's the only defensive part of the whole armor. It's the very thing Jesus used in dealing with the devil. You know what? Jesus, he had all the other armor. But when the enemy came after him, brother, brother Andrew, he didn't just stand there and let the enemy hit that and bounce it off his armor. Uh -huh. He said, this is war, dude. Yeah, you just declared war. <laughs> uh -huh. Woo. Uh -huh. uh, actually, it was declared in the Garden of Eden. Uh -huh. When Satan came and did Eve and Adam the way he did, and they yielded to that, <laughs> amen, God himself steps in and says, okay, it's, it's on. The battle starts here. You might bruise his head, but he's going to bruise. You might bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. Uh, Hallelujah. And so Jesus is there, and he is walking around, amen, in that wilderness. And the devil has taken him to a high point of the temple and told him, jump off and commit suicide. He's carried him out to the high mountain, and he showed him the whole nation of Rome, and he showed him all the big buildings and all the Roman Empire. He said, I'll give you all this. I'll set you on that throne if you'll bow down and worship me. Yes, sir. Satan's so doing the same tactics. He'll take you out and he'll show you. If you'll just bow down to me, I'm going to give you all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. In the 70s, the rock music industry, you can go back and read this. It's, it's in there. I have read it in their own words. Amen. Uh, we had groups, Black Sabbath, we had Chicago, we had Three Dog Night, we had the Beatles, we had, we still got Beatles, but mostly they're in Pine Creek now. But we had all these different groups who all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came to notoriety. Just out of nowhere, all of a sudden, there they were. Nobody had ever even heard of the Beatles in America. Next thing you know, they're the most popular thing in America. Uh, and in this article I was reading about this, one of these guys who used to work for one of those groups said that in the recording studios, they always had a meditation room with an altar in it. And they would take those first cuts and they would lay them, because back then we had records, okay? Anybody know what a record is? Uh -huh. Me and my wife do. Anybody else? Amen. We've actually got some records at the house right now. we even got a record player that plays them. How about that? Uh -huh. and, and they would take those first cuts, the, the thing that they were going to press the records out of, and they would bring it in, and they would lay it on that altar. This was from the words of one of those people themselves. And he said we would dedicate that to Satan and ask him to give us success. And it would happen. 
Can I tell you that if you can put that much faith in God, this world is yours. Hallelujah. Amen. If you can put that much faith in God, amen, God will do whatever you need done. Oh, Lord, hear me. The world has their faith in their spirits of hell. Amen. If we can put the same amount of faith in or more faith even in God. Hallelujah. It, it's unthinkable what all he can do. Amen. He needs a church that is on fire. He needs a church, amen, that's willing to say, okay, Satan, we have had enough. And they pick up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and they begin to go after him, and they begin to cut him down to size. I started to bring my sword out here, but I was trying to decapitate Melissa. But can I tell you, Amen. That's what God is expecting out of us. Hallelujah. As the church of the living God, all he wants is for us to dedicate and to consecrate. Amen. He wants us to get to the place where we can just step out into the battlefield and take the sword of the Spirit and begin to fight demons that are binding our town. Oh, come on, hear me. There's demons that are binding some of us. You need to start in your own Begin to bind the demons that have you bound. You know the reason Satan can get a foothold in your home? He doesn't have any resistance. There's no resistance there. But if you pray, if you use the word of God, that sword of the spirit is in your hand. Hallelujah. And begin to go after him. Not today. You ain't getting in my home. You ain't getting in my family. I rebuke and bind you. And begin to quote scripture to him. Hallelujah. It won't be long. Amen. You'll begin to see a victory erupt. You'll be, oh, come on. You'll begin to see things happen that you never thought would happen. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. And it will spread from your home. Amen. To others. And, and, and before you know it, the whole community is beginning to come and seek the Lord. Before you know it, many people from town, amen, will begin to cry out to God because they've lived so long in the false religion to this world and now all of a sudden amen they're finding the power and the truth of God hallelujah because somebody took out the sword and went to work in Hebrews 11 I'm closing the saints through faith said this the way he said in verse 32 and what shall I say more for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson Jephthah, David, and also Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms. You hear that? Who through faith subdued kingdoms. Wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. How much can we do for the work of God here if we just submit ourselves to Him? Hallelujah. In prayer and fasting and reading the word and, and using that word of God against every enemy. Amen. To this church and to this city. Why don't we stand? God, we love you. Thank you for your word. God, help us, Lord, to be strong in the power of your mind, oh God. Help us to be yielded to your spirit, God. Lord, we're asking you, God, that you would anoint, that you would touch, and you would help us, God. Uh, Lord, to do your will, help us to walk in your path, God. Uh, Lord, make us new creatures, Lord. Make us powerful men of God and women of God. Uh, let the Holy Ghost lead us and guide us and direct us, God. Lord, use us for your glory. God, we're asking you to find every spirit of hell, God, that would hinder God, in our own lives and in this city, God, we'll give you the praise and honor. Thank you for revival that's here. Thank you for revival that's already happening, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you.